that piece also give you a sense of the position. Good evening, colleagues. You may be seated. Deputy Vice Chancellors, Deans, Heads of Department, Members of Senate, academic and support staff, students, family and friends of uh, Professor Uchena Okeja. I want to particularly recognize his wife, Oge, and uh, his uh, two children. I should also recognize um, his dad, who is joining us virtually. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Molweni Huyanand Ekale, Bonsoir, Good Abend, Good Evening, and a very warm welcome to you all to Professor Okeja's professorial inaugural address. Again, I extend a special welcome to the family, friends, collaborators, and colleagues of Professor Okeja who have joined this special university celebration via digital platform. This evening, as is our tradition, we have the presentation of the inaugural lecture that follows university conferring the status of full professor on an academic. This time-honored tradition with origins in the medieval university serves as an induction of a new professor and as a platform to showcase their scholarly contributions to their discipline, to the university community, and to the general public. It is also an opportunity for a new professor to indicate what he will be doing for the rest of his professorial life. It is also an occasion in which we as academic peers, colleagues, students, family, friends, and the public celebrate the intellectual and scholarly achievements and contributions of one of our own. Promotion or appointment to the rank of a full professor is a significant milestone in an academic's professional and intellectual career. On behalf of our university community, I offer our heartfelt congratulations to you, Professor Okeja, on your promotion to the rank of full professor and for reaching the pinnacle of the academy. Honored guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I have a singular honor of presenting to you one of our newest additions to the illustrious community of scholars who hold the position of full professor of Rhodes University, Uchena Okeja. Uchena comes from a village in Nigeria called Okutu. For the most part of his life though, he has lived in different places in the world. In fact, he was neither born in his village, nor did he grow up there. Due to the nature of his dad's work, his family moved around quite a bit. He in fact has had a nomadic lifestyle. He considers, he considers himself an African at home in the world because he has spent more time outside his country of birth than he has at home. Uchena had a very happy childhood. The years he spent in the village were wonderful because he enjoyed the freedom and responsibility of village life. I have it on good authority that he was not particularly fond of school. He attended a village primary school and then went on to St. Kizita College in Ida. At Kizita, he was just an average student. The practice in the school was to rank students according to their scholastic performance. He tells me that in the first year of his enrollment, he ranked number 53rd out of 55 students. He had no option but to improve, improve his ranking because the students who did not have a certain average score were usually expelled at the end of each academic year. So he was really at the risk of being expelled at school. As was the practice during his school days, students had to choose between a science and arts focus after the first three years. He initially settled for arts, for the, for the arts focus, but he switched to science just a few months before the West African Senior School Certificate Examination. His teachers were naturally worried about this decision because there was little time to catch up, but he insisted on the change of focus. Apparently a friend had told him that arts was easy. And so he wanted to prove to the friend that there was nothing special about science courses. And he succeeded. Having passed his West African Senior School Certificate with flying colors, he moved back to the arts. Just, was just there just to prove the point. Professor Okeja started his tertiary education journey at Bagnana University in Rome, Italy, where he completed his Bachelor of Philosophy Magna Cum Laude in 2003. After that, he went to Germany, where he completed a master's degree in management at the University of Applied Sciences in Fulda. This was followed with an Egensung Brufang, which is an equivalent of an MPhil at Goethe University, where he also obtained his PhD. He taught business ethics and philosophy for a few years at the University of Applied Sciences in Fulda and Goethe University, Frankfurt. He spent time as an, as an assistant professor at this university before joining Rhodes University as a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy in 2015. In 2018, 
Uchena was promoted to the rank of associate professor. He has held visiting appointments at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, the Nubia Collegium at the University of Chicago, the, the Center for African Studies at Harvard University, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at Bad Hamburg, Justitia um, Amplificata Center for Advanced Studies at Goethe University, and the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of British Columbia. He is the author of two books, the most recent being Deliberative Agency, which was published by Indiana University. He has edited two books and co-edited an encyclopedia focused on the role religious leaders play in changing world history and politics. He is editor of the Rutledge Handbook, an African political philosophy, which will be published later this year, and co-editor of another forthcoming handbook on the ethics of migration. He has edited two special issues of philosophy journals. The first is a special issue of philosophical papers on African philosophy okay, wow. and global justice. And the second is a special I'm issue of ethical perspectives on Ubuntu and justice. He has published uh, more than 40 articles, book chapters, and reports has given more than 70 talks around the world. And the last, in the last four years, he has supervised two PhD dissertations and four MA philosophy theses at Rhodes. Professor Okeja is a conscientious academic citizen. Over the past number of years, he has served on a number of university committees, review panels, including as a member of the creative writing program at our university, consultations, advisory boards, curriculum development teams, and external examination spanning across the globe, covering local universities such as the University of Pretoria, University of KwaZulu-Natal, the University of the Western Cape, University of Stellenbosch and the Nelson Mandela University. He has also been involved with DECO, the NRF International, uh, International Universities, sorry, the NRF and International Universities, including the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He served as a member of the executive board of the Philosophical Society of Southern Africa until 2017. Currently, he's a member of the American Philosophical Association the German Association of Philosophers, the African Studies Association, and the European Business Ethics Network. Uchena works on practical questions in the fields of ethics, political philosophy, and critical theory. This evening, Professor Okecha will examine the difference between justice and injustice, which, as he says, are not opposites. Drawing on his more than a decade long research on justice and injustice, he will reconstruct an answer to the question, what is justice? It is now my singular honor and a great privilege to invite Professor Uchena Okeja to deliver his professorial inaugural lecture titled, What is Justice? Good evening, 
everyone. Um, thank you very much, Professor Mabizela, for this wonderful introduction. Thanks to the Deputy Vice Chancellors, the deans, colleagues, and friends for coming to celebrate this evening with me, my department, and my family. I will be speaking on the topic of justice, trying to reconstruct an answer to the question, what is justice? Uh, first of all, two preliminary observations. As you can see, I don't have PowerPoints to share. A very clear indication that I'm in the humanities. <laughs> Secondly, I am not going to do the classical philosophical thing where you just um, state a proposition, define the proposition, try to explain why that proposition is better than others that are out there uh, that try to explain a phenomenon and defend it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to come to an answer to the question, what is justice in a roundabout way? So if you are looking really for a very clear definition of what justice is, I'm sorry, you have to wait till the end of the lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm going to largely just read what I have uh, written. I hope you don't fall asleep and uh, that you would uh, share in the thinking process that went into the writing of this brief reflection. In Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, Okonkwa described the value of events such as the one we are observing today in the following way. And this is a quotation now from Things Fall Apart. A man who calls his kinsmen to a feast does not do so to save them from starving. They all have food in their own homes. When we gathered together in the moonlight village ground, it is not because of the moon. Every man can see it in his own compound. We come together because it is good for kinsmen to do so. Indeed, we are here today not because of the cocktail and food that will be served at the end of this lecture. I am sure all of you have better wine and food at home. Besides, no one that is really starving will honor an invitation to attend the lecture, especially one that is delivered by a philosophy teacher. The aim of our gathering today is indeed not because you cannot grow in wisdom if you do not listen to this lecture. As you know, I am neither an academic celebrity or an intellectual superstar. It's just an average student right from school <laughs> trying to, to, to make progress. Besides, Zoom has made access to the wisdom of others possible from every location, even from our different bedrooms. Like Okonkos people, we are here because solidarity is a beautiful and good thing. We are here because we recognize and appreciate the value of community. So thank you all for coming both in person and online. And talking about community, my journey as a scholar and teacher in the university was made possible by the contribution and support of a very large community. It is only fitting that I begin this lecture therefore by expressing my gratitude to this community. I'm definitely going to be brief about this, but this should not be taken to mean that I do not value some of the help I received over the years. I am very grateful to my department at Rose University and all the people that I've collaborated with, friends and well-wishers. Although my parents, Sir Christopher and Lady Felicia, are not physically present at this lecture, they are able to listen to me on Zoom. Hi, if you can see me. <laughs> Let me use this opportunity to thank them for their sacrifices. My parents did not teach my siblings and I about life by means of merely a mere spoken words. They showed us through their actions what it means to be alive and to be a responsible member, members of the community. 
effortlessly. They showed us what it means to work very hard, live simply, honestly, confidently, and carry oneself with audacious dignity. They didn't have to tell us they loved us. They never did, actually. <laughs> Without the love in their actions and daring sacrifices. For this, I say thank you. I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the most amazing and special person in the world, my wife, Oge. On the 13th of April this year, we will celebrate the ninth anniversary of our marriage. The years we've spent together have been nothing but amazing. Thanks for all the shenanigans <laughs> we've engaged in. Thanks for accepting the responsibility of loving this, well, on, uh, on, uh, seriously on serious guy. Our children, Aka and Bellucci, deserve all the love in the world. Both of you remind me daily of the point of all the strivings. I must say to Aka and Bellucci that this is what Papa does when he's not at home. I come to this beautiful place to put on these fancy clothes and speak to very intelligent people. Isn't that cool, guys? <laughs> My siblings are just a perfect combination. Thanks, Joe, Julie, Ike, Mary, Chika, and C, for being there, especially when I'm most annoying and difficult. You understand my quarrels with humanity and the gods, and remind me constantly that the world is a real thing out there. Well, let me pretend for a moment to be wise and offer an unsolicited advice. Never you guys forget the first commandment of the family, Inon Ketibunjo. Laziness, idleness is an abomination. That's what our parents always told us. Since you will not be permitted to ask questions during this lecture, let me modify this rule. Don't forget to chill and celebrate the ordinary things of life. I've been a lucky student. Most of my teachers in high school wouldn't even remember my name. So anything I learned from them beyond the classroom was not because they liked me more than other students. All four boys in my family were enrolled in the same high school at different times, and all but our oldest brother faced a specific challenge. Our oldest brother took the idea of hard work a little too seriously. So he performed so well in school that all the teachers decided to associate the Okeja surname with high standards. So when the other Okejas got enrolled, there was a serious challenge. In my case, the more the teachers expected me to be outstanding, just like my older brother, the less I understood their expectations. Despite my imperfection though, my teachers in high school took their time to help me to understand such courses as chemistry, biology, and physics, and the rest of the other courses in the sciences. Notwithstanding their surprise that I was not a good student like my brother. Some of the friends I started out with at high school have remained my closest friends over the years. I'd like to thank Man Kachir, Idox, Osi, Guajos, Kekensi, Baptist, Kentus, and other members of the class of 99 for their kindness and support over the years. Beyond high school, I continue to enjoy good luck with my teachers. I'd like to thank Yog Dizzy, Richard Hartman, Thomas Schmidt, and most especially Matthias Nussbachmann for their support and contributions to my development during my undergrad and postgrad studies in Germany. Matthias Nussbachmann has been exceptionally supportive in ways I cannot even describe adequately. I believe he's listening online. Thank you, Matthias. My friends during undergrad and postgrad deserve special thanks for, the kind, for all kinds of reasons. I must mention CY and Julie for being always a call away when you are in foreign land is not easy. So <laughs> Julie excelled in football and CY became an outstanding goalkeeper. Now that I am wiser, I'm a wiser man, I must say to both of them that I also excelled in watching them play the beautiful game. Thanks for all the laughter that helped to keep our aspirations intact, for laughter in the face of adversity helps to protect our sense of dignity and humanity. The games we played and all the jokes we shared 
provided me, uh, provided a lot of those laughter. And you did this alongside Eyere, Mispa, Richard, Valentine, William, Rogers, and Simeon. I must also express my gratitude to Juli Julian, Dorothea, Chieluzuna, Kajitan, Uke, Paul, Ajume, Handel, Kenneth, and Philip. Philip, I'm sure you're online. Please do keep in mind our plans for the whales. It's been a long time coming, but it's gonna come surely. South Africa has been generous to me and my family. Here we have found a family and lasting friendship. My South African people, I thank you for your support and encouragement, for your generosity and open-mindedness. I'm very grateful to have present my friend and brother, Faisal Garba. Faisal, although you made the wise decision to switch from philosophy to sociology back in the days in, in Frankfurt, <laughs> you've remained faithful to the pursuit of wisdom. Perhaps I should have switched to sociology as well. That would have helped to improve my skills in quantitative methods, and at least inform my wife that I'm also good in quantitative methods like her. I might sound, it might sound amusing, but it is true that philosophers are proud to say they cannot define their discipline. If I had switched Faisal, I would have at least been able to say what I'm doing, what my field is about. <laughs> How much does a degree in sociology cost these days? I want bounce. <laughs> thanks, thanks, my guy. Thanks to Asonzi, Muche, and his family, Wumi, Adeinka, and family, and the Benkiri family. I appreciate all my friends present and those unable to be here. I also recall with gratitude the kindness and support of departed friends and mentors. Ifan Yimenkiri, Ife Obona, Charles Mills, Anaklet Kayuka Mukumbu, and Ephraim Silas Obot. May your memory continue to be to us a blessing. Now, the lecture. We feel very strongly about injustice. When we believe we have been treated unjustly, we may feel a sense of indignation, humiliation, resentment, anger, or a combination of these emotions. Although we do not react to injustice in the same way, it would be correct to say that no reasonable person would want to live in an unjust society. Besides our basic basic instinct to survive. We imagine that we deserve to live in a just society because we have an interest in living a decent life. The problem, however, is that justice is an intractable concept. This means we can hardly agree on the form of ideal society that justice is supposed to motivate us to strive to create. Phil Clark, whose work on the Gachacha in Rwanda provides a penetrating insight into the pursuit of justice in the shadows of deliberation, recounted the following about his observation of a gachacha session. And this now is a direct quotation from his book. In a Rwandan village near the Burundi border, a crowd chatters impatiently beneath a tattered blue tarpaulin shielding them from the midday sun. Before them, a long wooden bench sit nine elders, mostly middle-aged men and women, led by a young man, the president of the panel, who stands and addresses the gathering. The president explains that it, in their midst today is a prisoner released from jail a week ago, who has confessed to committing crimes during the 1994 Rwandan genocide which in a little over three months claimed the lives of between 500,000 and 1 million Tutsi and their perceived Hutu and Twa sympathizers. The task of the gathering, the president explains, is to listen to anyone from the village who saw what this prisoner did, to hear from the victims' families of their pain after losing loved ones during the genocide, and for the nine judges who have been elected by the community for their wisdom love of truth and justice and dedication to the well-being of the village to decide the case of the accused. The president calls for a minute silence in memory of those killed during the genocide. And then after reading a list of procedures that will guide the running 
of today's event, uh, meeting, he motions to the prisoner, he motions the prisoner forward to address the assembly. A moment goes through the gathering as the prisoner walks to the front, standing between the crowd and the nine, nine line of judges. He mumbles and the president tells him to speak up. The man with his head bowed explains that he has come to confess that he killed the wife of his neighbor in the first week of May, 1994. He found the woman hiding in, the, uh, in bushes as a gang of killers walked the parts of the village searching for Tutsi. When he found her, she was crying, screaming at him to let her go. He pulled her out of the bushes and threw her to the ground, then slashed his machete once across her neck, then again, and left her to die. The prisoner, head still bowed, says that he has come today to apologize for what he did. When he was in jail, he had many years to think about his actions and his conscience was so heavy that he confessed his crimes to the authorities. A pause, and then the president asks the assembly if this man's testimony is true and complete. The crowd remains silent. Eventually, one man at the back stands and says that, yes, it is, the, it is true that this prisoner killed the woman. But what he has not told the assembly is that the following day, he also killed the woman's son with a machete and threw the body in a pit latrine. Another woman stands and says that she's, she too saw the prisoner kill the boy. The president asks the prisoner to respond to these new accusations. The man raises his head slightly and says that it is, true, it is not true that he killed his neighbor's son. When he received word that the boy was dead, he himself was miles away on the road to Kigali where he had fled in shame after murdering his neighbor's wife. Voices clamor in the crowd. He is lying. I saw him in the village on the day the boy was killed. I saw him too. He spoke to my wife in the courtyard that afternoon. He killed others too, more than the woman and the boy. The president asks for calm and for each person in the assembly who wishes to speak to do so, one at a time. People start to cry. The judges seated on the bench scroll on the notepads on their laps. In one week, they will have to decide what crimes the man committed during the genocide and what punishment he should receive. When this case is decided, there will be more cases, more stories of pain and loss, more claims and counterclaims, more details to verify more decisions. This hearing took place in the Bugisera region of Kigali, Ngali, Ngali province in 2003. End of story taken from Fick Clark's book, published in 2003. How do we explain this experience? Beyond simply saying this is an interesting story, how should we make sense of this approach to justice in the aftermath of a difficult and simply unimaginable tragedy. And what can we learn about the nature of justice from the answers we can conceive to these questions? The main goal I have tried to attain in my research over the years has been to understand the nature of justice and the role its imagination plays in helping people to negotiate the realities of living under unjust social and political conditions. I work primarily on how injustice manifests locally and globally, be it with regard to migration or any other question. In my publications, I've sought to understand how we should think about the experience of injustice and where we should begin, uh, where we should be looking if we want to understand the idea of justice and the reason it is one of the things that stir strong emotions in us. My efforts have yielded modest outcomes they have led me to a few findings, very few, and I'd like to share them with you this evening. The first thing is that thinking about justice as the opposite of injustice is inadequate. It may in fact be harmful to think about justice in this way. In the philosophy literature on justice, there is a strand of thought called ideal theory. 
Although it sounds fancy and obscure at the same time, ID theory is simple. The main advocates of this of, of ID theory argue that to understand the meaning of justice, we should begin by imagining a state of affairs that best expresses this idea. When we have fashioned out such an ideal picture, the proponents of this theory, as, uh, theory suggest, we can then proceed to stipulate the obligations and duties that are necessary for there to be a just society or at least a conception of justice. The fundamental assumptions of ideal theory are one, that justice is a moral problem, and two, that injustice is, to a very large extent, the opposite of justice. So the claim of the proponents of ID theory is this. If we have a picture of what a just state of affairs is, then we can work towards resolving injustice, either here and now, or in a future society, we can set about to create in the image and likeness of this ID theory of justice. My reflection on this theory has led me to the conclusion that this approach to defining justice is inadequate. I think it is neither plausible nor necessary to assume that justice can be understood by imagining it as the opposite of injustice. My reason for this conclusion is simple. It's simply the fact that when we experience injustice, we experience something real. This is the same with the experience of justice. We experience something real. This means that we will fail to explain the nature of the experience we call injustice if we imagine it merely as the opposite of justice. Besides, the experience of injustice can lead to fundamental damage to agency and dignity that cannot be repaired by imagining even the most amazing conception of an ideal society, uh, ideal just society. More is needed. The second thought on justice I would like to share with you from my research is that justice is a human project. It is not just an abstract idea that is fixed for all ages for all of humankind. Instead, justice is a project of concrete human beings who exist in the here and now. These human beings have a sense of history and an, an imagination of a future. This means that justice is enacted. That is, it is a second nature in the sense that we do not grow up to be automatically fully just individuals. We are the sort of beings that must learn to be just. Philosophical theories of justice tend to sidestep this, at least some of them, tend to sidestep this reality by focusing on the sort of principle of justice that is universalizable and plausible. I think the most rigorously argued theory of justice is what very little if it discounts the understanding that justice is a collective project of real human beings. My third finding is that justice is necessarily inflected by historical memory. Just as we learn to avoid dangers as human beings, so too must we learn to be just. The way we learn to avoid danger through experience is also the same way we learn to be just through experience. For instance, when we fight a war and experience its destruction, we learn to value peace. Well, you, one might say, well, maybe not in every African society because they don't seem to learn from the destruction of war. <laughs> that is, we learn to avoid danger, the danger of war by recognizing the value of peace. In the same vein, the historical memory that informs our sense of, it, of justice refers to manifest ways in which human beings learn to be human. Although this means that experiences that shape the nature of justice differs from community to community, as modern individuals, we have come to understand that our anthropological constants are the same. By anthropological constants, I want to refer to the fact that we are born, we, we grow, we die, we are finite, we perish because of hunger, diseases, and so forth. These are anthropological constants. No matter the technological or whatever advancement, they remain the same more or less for everybody. On the basis of this recognition, the context specificity of the historical memory that shapes our sense of justice is not a barrier to stipulating a universalizable idea of justice. In fact, our specific experiences demonstrate to us that every human being 
every human person deserves to be treated justly. The fourth point is that justice is unjust if it does not affirm the agency of its subjects. The idea is that the very process of enacting justice cannot be unjust. Regardless of how wonderful our idea of justice is, it would amount to nothing if it is built on an unjust foundation. I am sure many of us might have heard the, have read this, the Omela story. It is a story that demonstrates why it is important to ensure that the foundation of virtue, that the foundations of virtues are just. The Omela story is simple. A community is happy. Everyone gets all that is necessary to live a wonderful life. They did not have to, they, they did not only have enough to eat, but they had great institutions. But the price for all this is that a child in the community must remain in a perpetual uh, state of misery. This, in a nutshell, is the Omela story. Would it be a just trade off? Would it be just to trade off the misery of one in the interest of the happiness of all? My engagement with the idea of justice and the experience of injustice shows that we cannot even begin to imagine what justice is if we do not affirm the agency of the subjects of justice. Finally, justice is more than punishing a criminal. It requires the development of a sense of coexistence in situations where there are feuding groups, opposed interests, as well as beyond such situations. Where there are no feuding groups or opposed interests, the imagination and meaning of justice depends on nurturing, and, on nurturing of encounters and sensibilities. This is the reason it is impossible to be just to someone whose basic humanity you detest or completely deny. An idea of justice by its very nature presupposes a commitment to living with other people whose basic humanity we recognize and respect. Any talk about justice would be meaningless, therefore, in the absence of an intersubjective recognition of the humanity of others. Our commitment to justice is thus an expression of a fundamental interest in nurturing coexistence in society, even with people we disagree fundamentally with. Now, one might ask, how did you, Chena, come to these conclusions about justice? The answer is straightforward. I came to these conclusions by taking the experience I have had about the pursuit of justice as a starting point of my reflection, thinking from where I stand, not from where the literature stands. I have read many philosophical theories of justice. My training in philosophy, of course, included the study of justice in moral and political philosophy, and you can trust in German universities, the Torah. During my undergraduate studies, my lecturers did not did their best to help me to understand the concept of justice and why it matters for politics and interpersonal accountants. The problem for me was that the more I read the so-called classical theories of justice in philosophy, the less certainty I had about the meaning of justice. When I reflected on this situation, I concluded that the reason for my confusion is twofold. First, it was not immediately evident that the dominant theories of justice in philosophy had any practical use. The arguments were too nuanced, too neat to have any relevance in the affairs of real human beings. You know, you make caveats here and there, protecting your core argument from rebutals. That is the task of philosophers to be logically very clean. Second, the teaching of these theories of justice lacked the relevant contextualization that would help a cultural outsider like myself to understand them. Consider for a moment the case of Plato's theory of justice. In his book, The Republic, Plato argued that justice is a master virtue which entails a harmony of the three parts of the soul. As an undergraduate student with an African heritage, it wasn't evident to me why this guy would think of justice in this way. I wondered for a long time how he knew that the soul had exactly three parts. Besides, I did not quite understand how we could tell apart the three parts of the soul. Was the distinguishing trait of the tripartite soul their color, shape, ugliness, or something else? 
Because what occupied my mind mostly was how to explain the experience of people in my part of the world, an experience that reduces at the most fundamental level to negotiation of life under near perfect conditions of injustice. It was natural for me to be interested in those branches of philosophy that dealt with justice and practical questions, right? My main concerns, my main concern rather, was to figure out how we can construct a more just society by repairing currently unjust structures and institutions in Africa. This interest was certainly impossible to achieve with the tools I was offered by the theories of justice in political philosophy. So I had to figure things out myself and see what I could do. I discovered a way to deal with this situation when I read theory that's called Cartesian Handel, that is a theory of communicative action by Eugen Habermas. Among other things, Habermas argued in this book that philosophical questions were different from other questions. He was adamant that philosophical questions manifest as such when we understand them within the context in which they emerge. This brought me to take very seriously the question regarding the starting point of my engagement with philosophical questions. In dealing with the question of justice, I asked myself where I should begin. Usually the starting point for engagement with philosophical questions is the world of sensory per perception, or as we call it, experience. To understand justice, therefore, I had to consider the experience of the phenomenon from where I was standing. Anyone who lived in Africa knows, who has lived in Africa knows that justice is enacted through public deliberation. To understand the meaning of justice in this context, we must start, the starting point ought to be a reflection on the nature of public deliberation. We must consider why this practice remains a, a default mode for the pursuit of justice among Africans in the continent and the diaspora even today. Once I came to this realization, I recognized that the basis we need or the basis we needed to be able to understand African approaches to coexistence in the so-called modern era is right before us. By approaches to coexistence in the modern era, I mean practices like alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and some people would call it, is very popular today, transitional justice mechanisms like the Gachacha in Rwanda, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, and the national conferences and reconciliation that were held in the late 80s, early 90s in such countries as Nigeria, Congo, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and most recently in the Gambia. These approaches to coexistence enabled Africans to reinvent the foundation of a humane society after the experience of calamities like apartheid and genocide. They enabled them to overcome political iniquities like murderous military despotism that were spread across Africa at some point. They have not given up. <laughs> there, there have been some military coups here and there in Africa recently, or threats at least. All this is to say that my understanding of justice is shaped by the approach of pursuing justice through public deliberation. In the story I recounted at the beginning, we see an example of this approach to attaining, attempting to realize justice through public deliberation. You can see the different steps and the different efforts in that story. By examining justice as an outcome of what the Cameroonian philosopher, Jean Godefroy Bidima, regards as the staging of the word, we can reconstruct a plausible and desirable idea of justice. But to begin this reconstruction, we must know the context in which this approach to justice manifests. That is, the context in which it makes sense to consider that justice as a practice of public deliberation is of philosophical interest. When we examine contemporary African societies, what would be our verdict about its social and political health? What category can we deploy to capture the experience of reality in contemporary Africa? I propose to capture the most fundamental experience of reality in this context as existence under unjust structures. Living under unjust social and political structures leads to a life of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage. This is the story of the experience of the individual in contemporary Africa. Understanding the meaning of justice for one embedded in this context necessarily entails 
interrogating the context of justice, namely the nature of life under unjust structures. A story could help us to understand what I mean by existence under unjust structures. In recounting this story, my aim is neither to offer a proof of what constitutes a structural injustice, nor to show that certain patterns of institutional arrangements are susceptible to creating a life of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage. My aim is to show why it makes sense to imagine existential conditions that are mediated by deeply unjust social and political structures as a life of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage. This means that my aim is not so much to analyze the nature of structural injustice as it is to understand what this form of injustice means in light of the way it is experienced. To, to say it differently, the specific aim of my discussion of life on, in contemporary Africa as existence under unjust structures is to articulate what an experience of despair that is the outcome of deeply unjust social and political structures means. We can capture the experience of reality in contemporary Africa through the prism of the story of Kayo Nesmo. This is the story constructed by J.K. Sika, a Ugandan philosopher, to capture the despair that defines everyday life in modern Africa. And this now is the story from Kisika. Nesmo was born in a village in Uganda. He spent most of his infancy in poverty. His mother did not have enough breast milk to feed him. The family could not afford supplementary foods, even the staple food that could be procured from the small chamber that Kayo's father had inherited from his grandfather was insufficient to feed a family of 10. So they had to supplement by walking for food from neighbors. Oftentimes these men trekking long distances to find one in need of their services. Kayo's father was a charcoal burner. No sooner had Kayo mastered the rudiments of reading, writing, and addition than his father advised him to fend for himself as he too had done. Kayo Nesmo, who had by then been confirmed in his church, began his long journey of survival by burning charcoal. The owners, because of the trespass on private property or forest reserve, always harassed him. If they agreed on the mode of sharing, he always felt cheated. Whenever he took a sack of charcoal for sale, he hated to pay the, the market tax. So he resorted to traveling late at night. Yet he had to pay the owner of the bicycle he used. Tired of this trade, he was attracted to the nearby town where he did a potter's job for a few coins per day. But as he could not afford to pay as was needed for each team, Kayo went back to the village to resume his trade. He got a woman and rented a two-chambered grass-touched house. With one more mouth to feed, Kayo worked harder cultivating other people's gardens. Thus, he gained enough money to buy a piece of land and a radio. In due course, the woman gave birth to twins. He liked developmental ideas and was in a sense developmental, a development prostitute in that he has tried almost whatever one government proposed through radio programs. Despite all this, he has been unfortunate because anytime he begins a new project, he is disappointed at the time of sales. The prices of these products are set by forces beyond his control. The talk of the dollar effect, which he vaguely grasps. The prices of the necessities of life are always rising compared to his meager income. He's compelled to buy second hand. Meanwhile, his family grows. They talk to him of family planning, which he does not comprehend, but he entrusts these worries to God alone. Now, in his 40s, he begins to question the name of Onesimo. He queries the so-called obligations to the church and state. As I write, as Kesika writes, Kayo is on his deathbed, surrounded by his six malnourished children of tender age. His languishing longing to get Medicare, which he found he could not afford. End of the story from J.K. Sika. One of the ways to deal with this sort of experience is to consider it an unfortunate situation. 
In the literature on knee justice, a standard approach to this story of Kyle Nesmo would be to make the judgment that the problem Nesmo face, uh, is confronted with is the injustice of poverty. Another way to describe this experience, besides the narrative of injustice, is to propose an intersectional account. This account will propose that Kyle Nesmo and people like him do not just suffer because of one instance of injustice, but due to interconnected structural arrangements that trap them in a circle of oppression. Certainly, there are things to learn about Kyle Nesmo's situation when we reflect on it from the angle of injustice, intersectionality, and social oppression. It seems, however, that the insights these approaches offer are insufficient. I propose to refer to the experience that defines Kyle Nesmo's life as a life of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage. I think this is an accurate view for three reasons. The first is that this form of life indicates a collective tragedy of the current historical moment. This form of life is not an outcome of a single circumstance or factor. Instead, it is the result of long and interwoven historical encounters that have become so reified, it now manifests as a foretold misfortune that will surely come to pass. We say this in the reality that being born in certain countries, in certain families, and positioned in certain ways in the world, means that one will inevitably contend with avoidable sufferings, suffering and disadvantage, the end of which is almost unimaginable. The collective dimension of this tragedy, that is the certainty that one will necessarily have to contend with avoidable sufferings and disadvantage, that one will perpetually be in debt, even as one observes others having a currency that paid in advance for all their needs, this situation, Inheres in this tragedy inheres in the fact that the very nature of the structures that mediate coexistence in the world reinforces the situation. Thus, as long as the world exists in the current form, it holds that people born or positioned in certain ways have to contend with these avoidable sufferings and disadvantages. The point is that our collective participation in the structures that govern the modern world reinforces the certainty that subjects of certain backgrounds and positionality will continue to contend with avoidable suffering and disadvantages. This is nothing short of a collective tragedy of the modern world. Retorting that the issue here is the corrupt system of governance, both at home or globally, does not take anything away from my point here because the corruption invoked is itself an outcome of the reified historical encounters I already mentioned. The second reason I consider the experience of Kyle Nesmo, of, uh, of the Kyle Nesmos of this world as a situation of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage is that it is a disaster built on hopelessness. In the sphere of social and political life, hope is a necessary virtue because it enables us to continue to believe in the goodness and value of human beings. Hope inspires us to believe that regardless of circumstances, the goodness of human beings will triumph. By this means, hope shields us from the destruction of imagining the abyss of evil as our main orientation to reality, to encounter with other people. For the Kionesmos of the world, however, this unfolds as an experience of powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis the structures. Sorry, for the Kionesmos of the world, however, life unfolds as an experience of powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis the structures that mediate coexistence in the society. This experience of powerlessness leads to hopelessness because it destroys a vital aspect of the belief in the goodness and value of human beings, namely the understanding that all human beings have equal worth and could attain fulfillment of their purpose and find meaning in doing so. Living in full realization that one cannot do anything whatsoever to improve one's social, political, and economic condition is a fundamental defeat that pushes one to the deepest abyss of despair. Such an experience leads to a loss of hope and a life that is defined by this kind of hopelessness is surely a human-made disaster. This is a situation of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage because 
the absolute because of the because the absoluteness of the experience is unparalleled. This is the reason the subjects of this experience live constantly with the pain of realizing that nothing worse than their present condition can be imagined. And this is why you see that there are numerous African youth that undertake a journey of almost no return, walking through the Sahara Desert to cross to Europe and other parts of the world because they imagine that nothing worse than what has happened to them in their homelands can be imagined. And so there you find the reason. There you see that it is not totally senseless, even though it is unreasonable for African youth to, to approach their death, even though they, knew, they know uh, even before they embark on this journey, that death is a possibility. The third reason I refer to the situation represented by, Kionis, by the Kionesmos of this world as an experience of life of unmitigated suffering and disadvantage is because of the damaging impact it has on agency. Living in a condition, in a constant awareness of one's marginality over time leads to a blunting of one's self-perception as an agent whether social, moral, economic, or political. This is the case because the constitution of agency depends on certain prerequisites. We can see why this point is important when we consider the case of moral agency. Recently, Gillian Brock argued that certain needs must be satisfied for moral agency to be secured. These needs include one, physical and psychological health, two, security, three, understanding, four, autonomy, and five, sufficiently decent social relations. This is taken from Gillian Brock, Brock's book that was published in 2020. These five basic needs must be met for us to function as moral agents. Not only do we need to be in good health to effectively carry out actions, we also need to be free from psychological impediments and have adequate security to be able to act. I mean, meaningful action, not just motions. I agree with Brock's argument because human beings are not the sort of beings that are born with fully developed capacity for, to function as moral agents. Without nurture, and by nurture, I don't mean just what we get from our family, but what we get from society, what society equips us with to be able to engage in this journey of life. Without nurture, it is impossible to grow and develop the full personhood we refer to when we talk about agency. Like Kai Onesmo, life in contemporary Africa often entails experiences that constrain physical as well as psychological health, security, autonomy, and community. The severity of this experience often leads to the damage of the capacity for agency. We see this all around us in many African countries. To this end, the three reasons I have outlined explain why it is plausible to imagine the experience of individuals in contemporary Africa as life under unjust structures, which leads to unmitigated suffering and disadvantage. Individuals in this context experience reality as a collective tragedy. Reality in this context is experienced as a disaster built on hopelessness. The understanding of justice I propose is rooted in this experience of the individual in contemporary Africa. The principle of justice I defend is derived from the immanent approach to justice in the, context, in the context just described as life under unjust structures. To be sure, there are a few certainties about life lived under unjust structures and political structures, just for emphasis. Among other things, reality is encountered in this context as a form of collective tragedy. Another certainty is that a specific kind of despair shapes daily life. Lastly, there is the certainty of enduring the loss of hope and the damage of agency. At a practical level, these certainties of existence under unjust structures mean that the individual, uh, that individuals do not have the sort of guarantees that make feasible an ideal theory approach to the conception of justice. The people who live under unjust social and political structures must take the fact of injustice as the starting point of their imagination of justice. That is, 
as the existential condition that prove, uh, provides the basis for all or any possible conception of a phenomenon, be it justice or something different. Taking the fact of injustice as an existential condition that forms, the, uh, that forms a basis for conceiving the meaning of justice requires that we do at least three things. First, it requires that we consider seriously the implication of the situation of the agents of justice. Second, it requires us to think from a position of complexity. Finally, it requires us to consider the implications of the dialectic between justice as a creator of reality and justice as a creation of reality for the meaning we attribute to the concept. Justice creates just as it is created. When we take these three points together, what will become evident is that a viable conception of the idea of justice must be open-ended. This is why justice is like I indicated earlier, a collective project of concrete human beings. And here we see the wisdom of Africans, even in their troubled situation, approaching the, the quest for justice from that perspective of engagement in public deliberation. When 9-11 happened, how did people respond? They banded together. When you are experiencing despair and tragedy, what happens? You come together. Not that anyone has the answer that you seek, but because coming together, sharing your hopes and fears is one of the best ways, is one of the most you know, authoritative ways that human beings have come to realize will help them to deal with their situation. The question to ask is this, and I'm coming to the end of the lecture. The question to ask is this, how should we define justice to take adequate notice of this unique experience of the world that I've just described? We can formulate a principle of justice that is inspired by the African experience in the following way. Justice is a form of respect and care that aims to preserve the value of life. Its foundation is the recognition of the humanity of others. Stated as a proposition, justice demands that we respect and care about the humanity of others, simple, period. Its pursuit requires us to align our personal interest to the health and survival of humanity, that is community. On this account, just actions aim to guarantee respect and care for the humanity of others. To embody justice means to nurture the selfless cap capability to align one's interest to the health and survival of humanity, which is what we call community. This means that justice does not command us to be merely objective, impartial, and uncompromisingly fair. More is needed. Justice requires us to be objective, impartial, fair, and much more because we aim to guarantee respect and care for humanity, for the humanity of others through these actions, through these actions of objectivity, fairness, and all that. The ultimate end of our strong attachment to justice is therefore our self-understanding that we are beings that are worthy of respect and deserving of care. Once we reject this fundamental core, justice will become nothing more than a public display of self-righteousness. It is possible to think that this conception of justice I have just outlined is problematic because it assumes that there is a necessary connection between justice and virtuousness. The idea would be that the idea of this objection or the point of this objection would be that I have mistaken being a just person with being a good person. This objection, objection can be developed in many creative ways, but I think the main point is clear. It is that a just person may be a good person, but it is not true that one must be a good person to be just. I'd like to borrow Kwasi Wiridu. Kwasi Wiridu is a Ghanaian philosopher who passed away recently at the age of 90. So he was a very wise man. I'd like to borrow the idea, the, uh, the borrow is, um, to, I would like to borrow from Kwasi Wiridu's uh, uh, insight in his response to an objection that was expressed by Odera Oruka another philosopher from Kenya. Odero Ruka tried to persuade Weredu to see that sympathetic impartiality, which Weredu proposes as the rule of morality, may not be a necessary rule of ethics because 
there is a possibility that human beings can act ethically on grounds of rational egoism. To this, what I do reply to that, a human being, and I'm quoting from where it is work here, a human being without a trace of sympathy in his or her own breast or hope of the same from any other will inevitably suffer the grievous type of breakdown. Where do went on to state that the problem of morality is not that human beings don't have sympathy, but rather that they don't always have enough of it. Mirroring the wisdom of Wiridu, I'd like to respond to the objection just stated by pointing out that a just person who has no trace of virtuousness or any hope of the same from other people will inevitably suffer the grievous type of breakdown. The problem of justice is not that human beings are not, are not good. It is that human beings are not always sufficiently good. From this understanding of justice, we can derive a number of basic values that should guide our conduct in different spheres of life. But to do this, we must have to provide a justification of this account of justice. I've not justified with this defended or just, justification as lots of us would say. This task to echo what uh, uh, Professor Mavizala said at the outset, this task is the core of my research for the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'm very proud to have a. Sir. <laughs> no, I'll just speak to Andrew. Um, this is quick. Um, yeah. Um, thank uh, for, his, for his speech and for his presence in, in the philosophy department at Melbourne in Mount Hamilton. And a small token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We will just try to send it. So a lot of parallels will come. Yeah. We can talk about it at some point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hey, Prof. <laughs> thank you. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, bro. Thank, thank you. 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 <laughs> Thanks, my guy. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank 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 you. Yeah, I will be here now. <laughs> hey. Thank you. 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 Okay, I'll do that. <laughs>